In today's video we will perform a very interesting uh, experiment, I think. So recently I was browsing the Case King store, which is something I do on a daily basis because we're listing thousands of products every year and therefore a lot of products every single day. And it's not really easy to keep track on what kind of products we're listing. So every single day I'm just checking what kind of new products we listed. And a few weeks ago I came across this product, which is the Alpine 12 passive CPU cooler from Arctic. Arctic is a brand you all should know. So it's the manufacturer of MX2 and MX4 thermal paste. So it's a manufacturer that has been around for a very, very long time. Even though I was very surprised to see a passive cooling unit like this in 2019. So let's say six or seven years ago, it was quite common that some of the manufacturers were manufacturing a lot of air cooling units and then also some passive cooling units. So Scythe was there was, for example, showing the Orochi, which was a massive air cooling unit. It was made for passive cooling, even high performance CPUs. So back in the days, a lot of manufacturers like Thermalrite were experimenting a lot. But these days, I was very surprised to see a cooler like this appear in our store. So, so this is a very simple aluminum heatsink, just aluminum extruded out of one shape. And when you have this very, very long aluminum heatsink, you just cut it into the individual pieces with the right size. And then on the bottom, typically, I would say just manufacturing the aluminum heatsink without anodizing and everything, it should not be more than $3 probably. And then on the bottom, you see that there's some CNC work done. So we have this elevated piece in the middle, which is probably to keep some distance between the CPU and the heatsink or the parts around the CPU to the heatsink. So we see example here, we have a lot of caps around the CPU socket. So that's the keep out area of the CPU socket and to make sure that the heatsink does not have contact directly with the capacitor. So there's nothing in the way, nothing blocking. I think we have this elevated part on the bottom. And this part also already contains thermal paste. So in this case, we have the Arctic MX2. Usually if I see thermal paste pre-applied on any kind of cooling units, maybe an air cooler or AIO, I directly remove it and replace it with a high performance thermal compound, especially if it's a high performance system we're building. So even if it's an NZXT or Corsair AIO, I just remove the stock thermal paste, replace it with maybe Cryonaut or whatever. But in this case, I think we will just leave it on the MX2 and see what the performance will be like of this cooling unit. So we also have four screw holes on the side here. So the, the mounting mechanism is really, really simple. We have four springs and we have four screws and we have some washers that go between the backside of the PCB and the screw heads just to prevent any kind of scratches on the PCB and also no kind of short circuits if there would be any kind of contact, uh, contacts in this area. So if we take a look at the packaging of the Alpine 12 passive cooler, we can see it's advertised with a maximum TDP of 47 watt, which is certainly not much. But then if we rotate it a bit more, then we can see it was tested with an i3-7300T, 37,700. T 7300T, which is from what I remember, a Kaby Lake 2 core with HT, and it was tested at maximum 78 degrees Celsius, tested in a tower with two active 120 millimeter fans. But as you can see on my table, we're not going to put it in any kind of tower. We will fully use it passive and just rely on the passive airflow. So on this setup, we have a Maximus 11 Extreme. We have two sticks from G Skill um, memory sticks. I'm also going to use this small tiny cute VGA, which is an EVGA 1050 Ti. I, I just use it. I just like to use it because it has no um, power connector. So it's very convenient to use for any kind of test like this, where we don't need the VGA performance. And then we have a 9900K, which is something that will be really interesting, I think. So 47 watt TDP for the cooler and 9900K certainly do not go hand in hand. The 9900K has much higher power consumption, especially on a board like this it easily consumes 150 watt in Cinebench, even if it's stock. With OC, easily 200 watt. So it will be really interesting to see how high we can push or what we can do with the CPU when this cooler is mounted. So I will just mount the cooler quickly. Mounting should be very easy and then we will start. So the setup is ready to go. I mounted the cooler, which is really simple and easy. As I said before, you just mount the screws with the springs and everything. It's very 
uh, straightforward. So then I also attached a thermocouple to the cooler on the bottom so we can keep track of the cooling temperature or the cooler temperature as well while we perform some kind of benchmarks. We will try to do a Cinebench R20 at stock, which is the new Cinebench. I never used myself before. I just put it on a USB drive, so I have to put it on my SSD first. And then we will try to perform a Cinebench R20. I'm not sure how long it takes. I'm not sure if the 9900K can make it once without throttling, but I guess there's only one way to find out. We're now in Windows. I had to initialize the SSD first, so I had to make sure all the devices are working, I had to reinstall the GPU driver, I had to pull over the R20 from my thumb drive to my system. So everything is ready to go now. What I find really interesting is that CPU temperature or the heatsink temperature seems to be stable now at 46 degrees Celsius. It had been there for, I don't know, two or three minutes already. It seems not to change so far, so that's really interesting. If we also take a look at the system, so we have CPU-Z open, um, CPU is con constantly clocked at 4.5 across all cores, sometimes goes to 4.3. Um, we can see the CPU temperature is very close to the heatsink temperature, so we have about 49 or 50 degrees Celsius. I also opened Cinebench R20, so let's just see what happens if we run the benchmark. Oh yeah, here we go. It's directly 100 degrees Celsius. So if we can trust the voltage reading is about 1.1 volt. CPU is now at 4 to 4.1 gigahertz constantly, which seems not even too bad. Core temperature is constantly 100 degrees Celsius, obviously. And heatsink temperature, yeah, keeps increasing, is now 57 degrees Celsius. So 42 with 36 points, doesn't even look too bad. Temperature is, I think, decreasing a little bit now. At least the core temperature, also heatsink temperature is decreasing a little bit and the clocks are back up at 4.5. So I think I will just run some Prime95 for, let's say, 10 minutes, see where the CPU clock and voltage ends up. Heatsink temperature is now at 87 degrees Celsius, it's not changing anymore, so it's pretty stable and also quite a lot better than I expected. So if we just move over to my system, we can see the 9900K is constantly clocking at 2.6 to 2.7 gigahertz. So that's the absolute worst case, which means that in any other application would it be Adobe Premiere, would it be gaming, would it be benchmarking, the CPU should clock higher, maybe 3 GHz, maybe 3.2, depending on the core utilization. Also, if we check in core temp, obviously core temperature is always 100 degrees Celsius because the CPU is completely in the temperature limit, which makes absolute sense. But if we check the power consumption, it says 54, 53 Watt. So that's actually higher than the TDP, what, which was recommended in, uh, on the cooler box. So it was recommended with a TDP of 47 Watt. And I think if we would translate that, so let's say we deduct roughly 6, 7, 8 Watt, then the CPU would probably run at 95 degrees Celsius core temperature. So I would say the TDP on this box is fairly accurate. That should actually work with 47 um, Watt TDP for a CPU. So what we will do now is I will just go to BIOS, do some fine tuning, um, probably lower the CPU voltage quite significantly, probably 1.8, 1.9 volt, increase the core frequency a little bit from what you're seeing now, maybe to like 3.2, and then go to some gaming. So we'll play some Far Cry and see what happens to the CPU clock, what kind of clock we can actually get stable in a game with this cooling unit. So I've been playing Far Cry 5 now for, I would say, roughly 10 minutes and it's, it's so much better than I expected. So I started off with uh, 3 GHz across all cores and 0 0.8 volt, which was really cold, so like 60 degree max across all cores and was no issue whatsoever. Then I kept increasing voltage and also clocks and now I am, I'm at uh, 3.6 GHz across all cores and 0 0.925 V core across all cores. And CPU utilization is typically something like 15 to 30 uh, percent. So it's not really that much in Far Cry 5 because it's also a bit GPU limited, obviously, with a 1050 Ti. But it works actually quite nicely with a 1080p. We have 40 FPS. It's, it's not perfectly smooth, but I would say it's playable. So, yeah, the temperature is 
typically 70 degrees Celsius, sometimes maybe 75, 77 degrees Celsius, which is still absolutely fine. I think we could go even higher to like 3.8 gigahertz at about one volt, maybe 0 0.975, that should also work. So yeah, you can actually passive cool a 9900K with some kind of adjustment. So you have to undervolt your CPU a little bit, also underclock your CPU a little bit, but still a 9900K, eight cores with HG at 3.6, I think is still quite powerful in a lot of games. It also shows that the cooler is capable of more than I expected. So I think with an, one of those new um, Coffee Lake CPUs, so an i5-9400, uh, which is I think a six core without HT, with some sort of adjustments. So also a little bit of undervolting, a little bit of limiting clocks. I think the, the boost of the 9400 was uh, 4.1. So if you limit it, that probably to like 3.8, 3.9 and uh, very good voltage, I think it should also be uh, possible to use this kind of CPU with a passive cooler. So I did not expect that it would be possible to use a nowadays CPU with a very tiny heatsink like this, passive heatsink without any airflow. Actually using this in a case could be even better, I think, if you would place a 120 millimeter fan above it with um, like a case fan. Um, could also be, or could also have negative impact if you're using a GPU that's dissipating the heat, uh, the heat inside the case. Obviously could also impact the temperatures negatively. Still kind of surprised, did not expect that you can run games with the 9900K passive cool. So let me know what you think about this cooler in the comments below and see you next time.